Okay, our next speaker is probably, no, not probably, definitely is one of the coolest people I know in this movement. We're so happy to have her here at Skepticon. She blogs at Heinous Dealings. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Hina Databoy. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Assalatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah, amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I must apologize. I've wanted to do that my whole life. And it translates to all praise to Allah, all praise to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, all prayers and peace to the Prophet of Allah, peace and mercy and blessings of Allah onto you. It's not because I've suddenly reverted to Islam, don't panic. I mean, I'm still pretty scantily clad as far as Islam's rules go. Um, it's because that's what most Muslim speakers do when they come on stage. They start off with this invocation of blessings and things like that. And as a child, I would watch these all male speakers go on stage and do this, and it never occurred to me that I wouldn't be allowed to do this. I thought, oh, you know, I do all right with speaking. I do all right with being the whole being smart thing. This is gonna be for me. And then I hit puberty and realized, oops. That's not gonna happen. But now that I've deconverted and stuff, I got to do that. So thank you all for indulging me a little bit there. <laughs> so this talk, taboos, you probably saw, you know, simple pleasures, it's complicated taboos. What is all this about? This is not Hina's usual thing. Usually I'm up here talking about, oh, you know, I used to be a Muslim blah blah or feminism blah blah. But I, I wanted to violate a taboo on stage. I wanted that to be the first thing I did when I got on stage. Um, it was a simple violation of taboo, a simple pleasure, because I just wanted to be a speaker when I grew up. That's what I wanted to do, so I came up here and I did what I wanted to do when I grew up. But it's complicated because I broke many, many, many taboos, such as a lady speaking in front of a mixed audience of men, women, and everybody in between and outside of that binary. I also am not a Muslim anymore, so I used a bunch of Islamic greetings and sayings where I probably have no business doing so. And someone's probably really mad right now at me, guaranteed. And this is possibly the least Muslim audience ever. <laughs> so what is a taboo? What am I talking about here? Um, I will admit I'm using the definition fairly loosely, but let, let's run it through a little bit. Um, it comes from a word that means set apart or forbidden. So that's what a taboo is. Um, it's defined as a prohibition or restriction that comes from social culture. So taboos generally don't come from laws. You know, there's no taboo against, well, there is a taboo against stealing, but there's also a law that tells you you're, if you get caught, you're gonna go to prison. Um, especially if it's not white collar crime, you're definitely gonna go to prison. But you know, steal from people's bank accounts, it's fine. You'll be fine. Um, in terms of most general ta taboos in mainstream culture, there's a don't ask, don't tell culture, I believe. There is this idea that you're just supposed to know these taboos. That if it's something is mainstream enough, it doesn't need to be explained. So I'm going to explain to you a few taboos that aren't so mainstream. And they come from my Islamic background, seeing as I, I started with a, a reference to that. Um, there are definitely some odd-seeming, probably to most of you, Islamic taboos that go beyond the normal, don't eat pork, women need to cover up, this is me being a hussy sort of thing. Um, <laughs> there, there are some odd taboos that were quite a relief to not care about after I left Islam, I must say. Um, one of them is sleeping on your stomach. Muhammad said that when he visited hell, because he had this vision where he went up on a winged horse to heaven and then he also saw hell. In hell, people slept on their stomachs. So don't do that because you'll be like a person in hell. As a stomach sleeper, this was very hard for me and I don't think it's any wonder I developed insomnia at the age of 10 because I was trying to stop my body from going onto my stomach every night. Dogs are another one, and this one you might know about, but you may not know why. In Islam, dog saliva is considered to be impure. So it's not that dogs are bad or evil or anything, it's that if a dog licks you, you have to wash yourself seven times in a very ritualized way. And most people don't want to be bothered. 
Farting is also kind of taboo in Islam. It's taboo in every culture for the most part. You know, you're not supposed to just let one rip when you're, say, on stage and very nervous or something. But, but you know, the, the farting is extra taboo in Islam because it breaks ritual purity. If you fart, you have to go wash your hands, face, arms, and feet at minimum three times each so that you can be clean again and you can pray. What washing those parts of your body has to do with, with your butthole, I don't really know. Beats me. Someone, someone invent time travel and ask Muhammad. I really want to know. I really do. Praying at certain times of day is taboo. So in Islam, there are five daily prayers. Uh, Fajr, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. They're, they're at different times of day. They're at set times based on the position of the sun. Although these days, we don't really look at the sun. We just have a chart. Or a nap, really. It just goes off when it's prayer time. It's, qu it's quite nice. If I were still Muslim, it would be a lot easier in those ways. But uh, there are certain times of day where you're not even allowed to pray even if you wanted to do an extra prayer because those were times where certain subset of pagans in Muhammad's time used to pray to the sun. So you want to make sure God knows you're praying to him and not the sun. We want to make sure that he knows that. Not that he knows your every thought or anything, you know. This is a taboo that came by way of my mom's best friend's husband. They're Egyptian. Muslims like to say there's one Islam. There really isn't. It's all different from culture to culture. And in his culture, in his version of Islam, calling a rainbow a rainbow was not allowed. You had to call it a khawsalah. I have no idea what that means. I have Googled it. I have asked people. No one knows. For some reason, he enforced this taboo on us. And this very Egyptian, very local-ish to him sort of taboo leached its way into my family. And so khawsalah, you can't say rainbow. Nail polish is a bit of a taboo in Islam, too. And it's because when you wash yourself for the aforementioned ritual cleansing after you fart or whatever, use the bathroom, you are supposed to have the water touch every part of your hand, including underneath your fingernails. And if you are wearing impermeable nail polish, you can't wash it. So somehow you're still dirty because your nails haven't been washed, even though they were clean when you put on your nail polish. So Muslim women will police each other. They'll look at each other, and if they have a manicure, they'll say, Oh, is it that time of the month? Because Muslim women don't have to pray during their menstrual cycle. So a lot of Muslim women will wear nail polish when they're menstruating, but never any other time of the month. So they'll look at each other and go, oh, okay, she's, she's on the rag. We know that because her nails are red or pink or whatever. This is a taboo that my parents didn't tell me about because you know, by the time I left Islam, I was still not married. If I had been getting married according to Islam, I feel like they would have told me this taboo. Muhammad prohibited having sex naked without being under the covers. You're not supposed to just be out and exposed naked and copulating. I'm not sure why this is. Apparently, it just makes you look like, he said it, you look like a donkey or something. But, you know, we're, we're all mammals here, right? You know, why not look like a donkey? So after I left Islam, as you might imagine, I was not at all interested in engaging in more taboos. Taboos are something I'm not a fan of anymore. But I did discover that there are plenty of passively enforced rather than actively enforced taboos in mainstream culture. And nobody wanted to explain them to me. I would go up to someone who I would consider more normal or mainstream and who seemed kind of smart enough to figure this out and I'd go up to them and be like, hey, so what am I supposed to do in XYZ situation? And they'd look at me and say, you know, just act normally. That's the worst thing possible you could say to me. Me acting normally? Do you really want to see that? Some of you ha have seen that. And it's not normal. It's not acceptable. And I discovered that too with sort of mainstream white wasp culture. Uh, one of my good friends from when I was very young is right before I left Islam. He got married a couple of years ago. And I asked him what I ought to wear because I had never been to a non-Indian wedding. And at Indian weddings, even if you're not the bride, you're you know, head to toe, sparkly, glittery, ridiculous clothing. And I didn't want to outshine the poor bride, right? So I, I asked my friend, you know, what should I wear? And he says, you seem pretty westernized now. You should be able to figure this out. And I gave him a look saying, what does that mean, I'm westernized? Could you give me some guidance? Could you give me your wife's email, something? The same thing happens when I talk to people who convince me against every good impulse that I have in the world, to go out to a club. 
you know, I'm a nerd, I want to sit at a bar with a beer and yell about trivia or philosophy or something. I don't want to go to a club and look at people and have people look at me, just, it's too much pressure. But I've, I've asked people, what should I wear to this club when they, they, they convince me that I ought to go? And it's always, just, you know, just normally, just what you would wear to a club. I just told you I don't go, why are you not explaining this to me? But I figured out that what a lot of it is, is this is how things are done. And if we talk about it, if we talk about how things are done, it somehow makes it sound weirder than it is. Because it is weird. Because norms and taboos are bizarre if you take them in abstract outside of their context and say, okay, why is it that we wear this and not this? Why is it that this person is supposed to do this and this person is supposed to do that? It breaks down, and I feel like the normals are afraid of that. They're afraid that if they talk about what it is that they do and explain it to somebody, they will realize how absurd it is and then their entire worldview just falls apart. <laughs> but don't tell them that, the poor things. Let them, let, them, let them keep going. So I adapted to how things are done without much help or guidance at all. The internet did help. I did find other people who weren't normal but who had adapted to their ways and I said, okay, so how did you do it? <laughs> they helped me out a lot. I struggled to leave Islam, sure, and I struggled as a Muslim, but I also struggled to join the world that was newly open to me, the more mainstream world. A wider world means that the taboos are not only not explained to you very well, they're also enforced in far more subtle ways. There's people rolling their eyes at you, or side-eyeing you, or slowly, they slowly stop inviting you to things, or you know, there's the whisper and the giggle and you look over and suddenly it's like you're in high school again and no one wants to talk to you. That's how taboos are enforced in the mainstream and it's very hard because some of us prefer direct communication. So some of the more subtly enforced taboos I have noticed that exist across most cultures and subcultures is showing effort. It goes back to the whole idea that you're not supposed to explain how things work. You're not supposed to tell people how it goes. If you show effort in any way, if you act like everything isn't completely natural and normal to you and you wake up like this, it's somehow a problem. Um, this especially goes with appearance. You're not supposed to say, man, it took me an hour to do this makeup today. You're supposed to be like, mm, this is how I always look. Look at this. My lips are always this color. I, I seriously though, I, I, I can't wait for the day that we can genetically alter ourselves. I want purple lips all the time, all the time. Fashion, you know, you're not supposed to say, oh man, it took me months to find the right thing. I mean, in certain circles, sure. But overall, you know, I'm not supposed to come up on this stage and expose to you every, all of the work and money and time and effort that goes into my appearance. Um, another thing that's sort of related is when you achieve notoriety or fame, you're supposed to go, oh, I'm just a nobody and I just like write stuff and you know, I maybe left this really oppressive religion, but you know, no big deal. I'm nobody. You're not supposed to own the fact that, oh my God, I'm standing on the stage at Skepticon. Rawr! You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be all dignified. <laughs> I, yeah, but you know, you can also shoehorn in your excitement into an example that you're giving very extractly. Clearly this is abstract, it's nothing to do with me. Another taboo is not showing shame for not adhering to certain norms. This sounds very complicated or complex. Let me give an example. Um, body hair on, on people who are women or perceived to be women. Body hair is not considered to be okay. But nobody's gonna come up to you and attack you with a razor if you leave your legs unshaved. That won't happen. Instead, you're not supposed to show your, your hairy limbs. You're supposed to hide them. Even Lady Sovereign, who's this grimecore rapper out of the UK, she's known for being sort of out there. Her, her first single that made it out into the mainstream, she talks about how she doesn't care about shaving her armpits. But then she goes on to say that she wears a big baggy t-shirt to cover up that nasty shit. So, you know, all right, we're breaking the norm, but no one can know. Except when you have a, a hit rap song. Somehow, you know, it's okay to rap about it, but don't show it. Don't show your armpits. Just tell everybody. There are subcultures within the main culture that have slightly less widespread taboos, but they are taboos that are enforced in certain ways. I have noticed in nerd culture that fanciness is taboo. If you look like you, you know, are wearing something besides a t-shirt or jeans, people are gonna give you this look like, 
oh, where did you come from? Why are you here? Are you a normal? Are they influence trading? How did they know about this? Abort, abort, pretend this isn't happening. But part of it too is, you know, for me personally, jeans and a t-shirt cost more money and take more effort than, than what you see before you that I'm wearing. I'm wearing soft fabrics with stretch in them, so I don't have to perfectly get every little size for every little fluctuation in the waistline that happens. But, you know, I look fancy, relatively speaking, to someone who paid $50 for a t-shirt at PAX or whatever. You know, somehow I'm fancier because with my thrift, st with my thrift store dress. In younger nerd culture, I noticed this when I was, you know, a teenager. There is a taboo against being too happy in your relationship, especially if you're a woman. You're supposed to be forever alone. You're supposed to be sad. You're supposed to be pining after someone who's completely unattainable. And if you're actually with someone and happy, will fie upon you. You're just making everybody else feel bad with your happiness and your love and your kissing. How dare you? Certain, certain facets of the atheist, secular, skeptic, whatever you want to call it, brights. Does anyone still use that term? I don't know. Um, there is a, a taboo against not drinking, I've noticed. I, 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 seriously, so, some of these events, it almost seems required that you get as close to trashed as possible. And that's a problem sometimes, because sometimes you don't want to drink that much, and sometimes drinking too much is not a good thing. Um, it's not necessarily that I think there should be a taboo against drinking. I came from that culture, and no thank you. That leads to worse problems in some ways. But you know, there, we should let people drink or not drink as they, as they please. We shouldn't be practically forcing it down people's gullets. That's not very nice. Within social justice communities, there are unspoken, sometimes, usually they're not unspoken taboos. Usually they're pretty explicitly stated. Um, there are taboos against certain slurs, insults, and language. And which slurs, insults, and language they care about really depends on where they're at. There are some that try to do everything. There are some that try to eliminate every facet of every kind of possible oppression in language. And then there are some that are more single issue. So, you know, you can go there and you can use a gendered slur, but woe on you if you use a homophobic slur or vice versa. But is that truly a taboo? That's a criticism I've, I get a lot, and I'm sure some of us here know what I'm talking about, where when I talk about how something isn't very nice or is kind of oppressive or is kind of of mean in some way, the, the, the answer I get is, oh, you're just, you're just acting like the Muslim you used to be. You're just trying to make everything taboo and forbidden and create new harams for the world. I don't necessarily feel that it's quite that way. And I think part of it is just where people find themselves. One example I can give is I went to go see Orgasm Inc., which is a great documentary if you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix, but I saw it when it was actually screening in the theater, The Joys of Living in Los Angeles or nearby. And I went with a group of people who I barely knew. I only knew two people and everybody else were strangers. And there was this woman who I was talking to and we went and had lunch afterwards because you know, it's a great way to, to, to start a discussion, films like that. And she's a Christian and she claimed that she was oppressed for being a Christian. And I'm sitting there like this. I, I, my, I couldn't help it. My arms crossed. My eyes were looking at her from the side. It just, it happened. I'm so, I felt bad, but it happened. And what, I asked her, how are you oppressed? What are you talking about? And this was, by the way, right when Obama got elected. So, you know, it wasn't like, you know, they hadn't had a Christian government for a while. You know, it wasn't like, you know, this Muslim atheist socialist was running things at the time. So, you know, how exactly, how exactly are, are Christians oppressed? And she said, you know, among my friends, I'm the only Christian. Aww. You know, and, and you think Los Angeles and Southern California aren't as religious as this area, let's say. You'd be wrong. The country's biggest megachurch right in Orange County, California. I drive by it all the time. And so I sort of... Me being me, I tried to be nice, but it failed. I said, why don't you come down to Orange County? Because like, that's where I live. There are really big churches there. There are lots of Christians. And you can make friends with them. And then you won't feel alone anymore because you're not actually oppressed. You're just feeling lonely. And she looked at me and said, oh, God, I hate those people. <laughs> it's the company you find yourself in. It's the company that you keep. 
So sometimes you might feel oppressed or like something is taboo because you found a group of people who are cooler than the group of people who would accept your oppressiveness. Unfortunately for you. It's true that all of us are oppressive jerks in some way or the other. I'm sure there's some area of social justice, even I haven't gotten to, some final frontier I haven't breached. But the only way to improve ourselves is to find out ways in which we are oppressive jerks and try to adjust that a little bit. And if talking about it, if even being able to say, hey, you might want to reconsider your language is, is responded to with, you're trying to create taboos and you're trying to take away my, my freedom of speech and you're censoring me, how can we become better? There is no way we can become better if that conversation gets shut down in that way. And honestly, if a space is too much for you, if a particular group of people or website or blog comment section, whatever it might be, is, is on a level where you feel like you're just constantly getting attacked, there are other places at other varying degrees of you know, priorities in terms of social justice that you can go. You know? It's not like you have nowhere else to go. Often it's not actually tabooing that is being suggested in the first place. Me saying, eh, I'd rather not you use the T word, is not me saying, you may not use the T word lest ye be tawed and feathered. It's just me saying, you know, I, I have trans friends, please, please don't be mean about this. Um, but I get accused of, of wanting to taboo it. Even if I were suggesting that certain slurs or language were to be taboo, it's not like I have enough power to actually enforce it on a societal level. I may be standing on this stage and I may have a, an amazing and fairly large audience in front of me, but this is a tiny, tiny, tiny subsection of the American population. It's not like I could suddenly make saying the T word illegal or, or legitimately taboo in some way. So that response is sort of disproportionate in a way. Now, that's not to say that taboos don't have a, a function. I really think they do in very limited uses. Because sometimes people won't do the right thing because it's the right thing. Sometimes you just kind of have to make it a little less socially acceptable for them to do it. Sometimes it's better to, to not just let it go, but to say, I don't like it when you say that. And if enough people say that, then they might consider the error of their ways. They might not actually become more inclusive or progressive, but at least they won't cause harm everywhere they go with what they're saying. You can say oppressive on the inside, just not on the outside. It's the important part. In terms of the future of taboos, I see a future where all seemingly taboo things have legitimate humanistic reasoning behind them. So it's not like a taboo against pork where I was told a bunch of lies about how horrible pork was and that's why I shouldn't eat it. Or premarital sex where abstinence-only education promotes that taboo with all kinds of lies and unscientific reasoning. But one where we actually have good reasons, where we say people are actually hurt by this or injustice is actually perpetuated by this. We actually have legitimate reasons behind it. Even if not everybody agrees with them because Trust me, you're probably adhering to a taboo right now, I know I am, that I don't like or agree with, but I'm going to go with it anyway because that's how it goes. So I see a future of taboos where taboos almost get outside the definition of taboos, where they're simply people trying to be less horrible people. Thank you. We have, we have time for q and I can't hear. We got half an hour, okay. All right, well, bring it on. <laughs> I will repeat the questions, yes. The question was, towards the end, I seem to be responding to Shirtgate, where Andrew Sullivan was claiming that liberals don't want people to wear their shirts or something. And would I address that? I'm really tired of Shirtgate. I wrote a one-off blog post about it. And it, it, for some reason, people have been sharing it and people keep showing up to fight and I'm just, I'm over it. I never ever would suggest that someone can't wear the clothes that they want to wear. I will, however, point out hypocrisies in the enforcement of certain dress codes. So if someone's wearing an outfit that has pictures of people in outfits that they couldn't even wear outside of work and get photographed without getting fired, because that happens, by the way. When women dress in clothing like the kind on, on the shirt, gate shirt, 
Um, there have been times where women have been photographed outside of work, completely away from work, wearing outfits like that, and then it got leaked to work, and then they've lost their jobs over it. So until we live in a world where that doesn't happen, I don't think you should be able to wear a shirt that has those outfits on your shirt. But it's not me suggesting that it should become taboo and forbidden and we should burn all the shirts. Um, it's a difference in, in level. And it's a straw manning, really. It's really an, an, a hyperbole, I think. It's not like I have the power to do that, me or anybody talking about it. OK, so the question, if there was a question, I'm not really sure, um, was essentially had to do with the idea of sexuality in Islam. The idea that there are apologists for Islam who claim that the taboos against certain expressions of female sexuality do not come from Islam itself, but instead come from the cultures around it. The answer to that is yes. You can't have Islam without the culture around it. You can't have Islamic cultures without Islam. So there are a lot of things that are actually in Islam that are taboo uh, sexually, um, including you know, having sex naked, like I mentioned, without a cover. Um, but also, the first time after you get married when you have sex, the man is supposed to put his, this is very heteronormative, by the way, there's no same-sex marriage in Islam, so I can be heteronormative here. Um, the man is supposed to put his hand on his wife's forehead and recite a special prayer to ensure that Satan doesn't also have sex with her while he's having sex with her. So imagine all this time you have been having threesomes. <laughs> Every time. But yeah, those taboos are definitely in the dogma. They're in the, the literature, and they are in the practice of Islam. But how that get in, gets enforced really depends. You know, you look at different cultures, they enforce certain things, and then other cultures don't. So the answer isn't, you know, oh, Islam is the worst and causes all the worst ever. And the answer isn't, oh, it's just culture. It's both. There's an interplay between them. You see certain things that in certain cultures where in the non-Islamic version of the culture, you don't see them. But you also see things that people say are Islam but are also reflected in the non-Muslim cultures around them. So I think it really depends on where you're looking at and what specific instance you're looking at of these particular taboos. Uh, yeah. To bring this back to the topic of taboos, I wish there were a taboo against saying X is worse than Y in a, such a broad way. I mean, certain people on Twitter could definitely learn that, that lesson, I think. I think they do a lot better with that. I, it's hard for me to say, oh, the practice of Islam is worse than the practice of Christianity or vice versa, because what are you talking about? Which Islam, which Christianity, where? For me personally, Christianity seems worse to me because I'm in the United States and my reproductive rights are not being taken away by global jihad or Sharia. It's the American Taliban. But going outside of the United States, yes, you know, there are crimes that are happening in the name of Islam. So I think specificity is just the way to go. It just, you're, you're less prone to error if you actually go in and say what you're talking about specifically, rather than saying, you know, this large global concept is worse than this large global concept. Um, that's the route I tend to go. Call me a little bit wishy-washy for not making definitive statements, but I feel like I'm less likely to screw up, so I'm gonna go with that. Uh, yes. Well, it, it is cultural, but it's also religious, too. In the Islamic world, it's pretty universally enforced. Um, almost all uh, people assigned male at birth are circumcised. I don't think there are any... Yeah, I've never even heard of it. Like, there are whispers of people who violate certain Islamic taboos, and I don't think I've heard of any Muslim man who, whose family did not do it. But I could be wrong. I I've never met every single Muslim and looked at his dick, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. But in the United States, yeah, I would say that's a taboo that you can see culturally has less clout these days. Fewer and fewer people are choosing to, to circumcise their, their children. So that's a good thing. That's a great thing. Um, yeah, and then, you know, not, not that I'm an intactivist. <laughs> Those people scare me a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I'm definitely on the side of that. And uh, yeah, but yeah, it's a cultural thing, but it's also a religious thing. Um, the funny part is, in, in Christian cultures, it didn't really become a thing until the Victorian era in the United States and, and to some extent in the UK because they thought that it would prevent masturbation. They thought it would prevent sexual immorality to circumcise people. It wasn't like it was a carryover from Judaism. There was, there was a gap there. Yes. Taboos are generally... Okay, so the question is the difference between social guidelines based on ethics and taboos. 
Um, I think there, there's overlap between them sometimes. It really depends on how it's enforced. I think what makes a taboo a taboo is you're supposed to follow it. You're not supposed to question it too much. People are going to get all over you in a significant way, not in a, a few people were mad at me on Twitter cry, but actually make your life more difficult because you're not following this. And a social guideline based on ethics would be more along the lines of, well, I don't want to be a jerk and I don't want to hurt other people, so I'm going to do this thing versus this thing. But yeah, they can become a little bit conflated. There are definitely guidelines for being a better person that have become taboos, that have evolved into, well, you don't do this because you're not supposed to. And I think there's, there's a devaluation there. If you're told to do something because that's what you're supposed to do and that's how it's done, it takes something away from this ethical choice that you're making. And so I, you know, though some people need to be told to behave, some people will never behave, you have to tell them. Um, at the same time, I think most people, you can show them the reasoning behind something and they'll follow it. At least that's my secret optimistic side showing. Yes. So the question has to do with if you have a service animal that's a dog and you get refused service by Muslims who run taxis or uh, stores or restaurants or things like that, what can we do about that? Well, we can point out to them that their social taboo that comes from their religion doesn't apply in the United States. That's, that's really awful and my, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know what can be done about that other than to make a big stink about it. Um, in a way that's hopefully not, you know, throw out those nasty immigrants. It, it's, a, it's a tough line to walk, and I understand that it's a huge problem for people with service animals in areas where Muslims run a lot of the, the local restaurants and shops and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I'm not really sure what can be done other than to make a stink about it, to bring up um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which does protect um, people's rights to have their service animals where they need them. Um, but yeah, other than going legal or whatever, um, there's really, there, there are actually, come to think of it, efforts that are happening in Indonesia where people are bringing dogs around for Muslims to, to encounter and pet and, and deal with. Because growing up Muslim, I never had actually interacted with a dog until I was 18 years old. And I was dating a dude who had the sweetest little beagle. And I, you know, I didn't know how to dog. You know, I didn't know what, what that meant. Like, what does it mean? Like, they don't purr. Like, what, what, what is, how do I know it's happy if it doesn't purr? Why don't all animals purr? It's an easy indicator. So I had to learn how to deal with a dog. And it was weird at first. And it was a little bit, the taboo still lingered. So when the dog licked me, I freaked out. Because that's where Islam says that dogs are bad because their saliva is allegedly impure. And some impulse in me did want to scrub my hand afterwards but I decided to let it go and just deal with it. And I think familiarization will help overall in the Islamic context if we sort of push the idea of, you know, okay, maybe you don't want to get licked by the dog, but just having a dog around that's not gonna bother you is not a big deal. And a lot of it is fear too, because if you've never encountered a certain kind of animal that everybody else in the world seems super easy and familiar with, that's kind of frightening. You don't really know what to make of it. Yes. So the question is, publicly violating a taboo, is that a good way to fight it or it just creates a backlash? Again, the answer is yes. <laughs> it, breaking taboos in public is a great way to sort of, it can call attention to the fact that that is a taboo. I think it's more effective when it's a situation where people don't realize it's a taboo or they think it's no big deal. I definitely say that applies for body hair. People think, oh, what's the big deal? You don't shave your legs, like who's gonna be mad at you? And then, you know, I'll send them an incident where someone said something to me and suddenly they realize it is a taboo and it is a problem and we need to stand up. I don't think it's that big of a deal, but it's just an example I'm giving. But in terms of backlash, um, there are certain ways of violating certain taboos that do create a backlash. And usually when the backlash happens, there's something else at play. So say if someone wanted to protest the fact that women have to cover their heads in mosques, and it's someone who's not from the Muslim community and they come in without a headscarf and they just wanna be accepted and allowed in there. 
at that point, you're playing with a lot of things there. It's not just you know, women being uncovered. At that point, it's also becoming outsiders coming in and telling the quote unquote natives what to do. So I think being thoughtful about all the factors around the violation of a taboo before you decide to use a violation of it as a protest against it can help to mitigate the backlash. But of course, there's always going to be a backlash, even as carefully as you might plan something. So I think you have to weigh those things against each other. You know, it's not like I've never done broken a taboo in public as a way to, to, to protest against something. You know, I've kissed a girl in front of a Chick-fil-A before, haven't we all? And of course their response was, you know, oh, well we serve all our customers equally. I'm like, yeah, and then take our money and use that against our rights. No, thank you, no. I'll make my own damn chicken. I think I saw more hands. Uh, yes, Lux. So there are um, a lot of gender norms are really more heavily enforced on women, generally speaking. There are, of course, there are taboos that men have to adhere to as well, and people of all genders have to, but there are definitely a lot against women. I wonder why that is, cough, cough. But uh, as, as a Muslim, I looked at Western taboos that women had to endure and thought that those were worse because I live in a Western society, right? So I looked around me and saw all these women starving themselves and, you know, removing hair in painful ways and feeling forced to look a certain way. And especially living in Southern California, the beauty norms are really heavily enforced on women. It's really, really hard to not, if you don't look and conform a certain way, people just, you don't, you pass beneath their notice. They don't, you don't even register to them in certain places. And so I looked at that and I looked at my headscarf and went, man, the headscarf's so much better. I can be as fat and as hairy as I want and it's nobody's business but mine and my mirrors. It's, it's just between me and God, right? And then I left Islam and I realized that, oh, uh, you know, capitulating to one set of gender norms isn't necessarily better to, than capitulating to another. So just because I was capitulating to a set of gender norms that I thought were better and easier in Western society didn't mean that I wasn't capitulating in the first place. So yeah, I, I changed my mind about a lot of things. And I would say that coming from the Muslim background and coming from that thinking has sort of given me a little bit more of an outsider's set of fresh eyes when I look at Western norms about gender. There are certain things that, yeah, I don't realize I'm enforcing or whatever, that does happen. But I definitely see things where other people think, oh, that's just how it is. And I think, well, why? We, you know, we're allegedly secular people in a kind of-ish secular society. Why can't we make our own norms? Why can't we get rid of the norms we don't like? And now coming into sort of questioning my gender identity and all that, um, that's a can of worms. That's in terms of figuring out norms because on some level, I didn't want to come out as gender questioning because I thought, oh, am I just mad about gender norms? Do I just don't want to be female identified because there are a lot of norms on me and I just want to put my middle finger up to them? But I realized that it was more than that. But I would say that, that there's, a, there's an uncomfortable relationship there that I am not done exploring. I'm just barely touching the surface, I think. Uh, yes. So the question is, reactions like Gamergate, are they um, reactions essentially to taboo breaking within subcultures? I would say yeah, because if you're a woman in nerdy circles, you're supposed to just sort of be one of the guys. You're not supposed to call attention to the fact that you're a woman in any way. You know, just pretend you're not a girl or something. You're some agender being, I guess, in that point. Um, and so I think, yeah, Gamergate actually saying, hey, you know, we are women, we are here, we don't like the gendered slurs. Saying I get a gendered slur is a way of saying I have a gender, which is what you're not supposed to do. Because if you call attention to the fact that you're a girl, then you're just asking for harassment and attention. Why are you being such an attention whore? Shut up, you know? No one cares that you're a girl except everyone does. And I'd say it's the same thing with um, a similarity that I see anyway, is with uh, the body acceptance movement, where half the world is telling me no one cares that you're fat, and the other fat, half of the world is like, haha, you're fat. So, you know, it's, it's, it feels like an impossible dilemma sometimes where, you know, half the world is telling you this is not a big deal, and the other half is saying this is all that defines you. And I'd say it's similar with gaming. You know, half of 
and I'm, this is not a scientific study, do not quote my data, please, in, a, in anything serious. But you know, half the group is saying, oh, no one cares, you're a girl. The other half is going, bitch, why are you in our boy space? So it, it puts you in an impossible situation where how do you address this when half the people are denying it and half the people are saying that's all there is to you? So yeah, that's definitely part of the reaction for sure. How are we doing on time? Four minutes, all right, last one, make it good, no pressure. No taboos are being enforced from this stage about quality of question. Oh, do we have a hand? Yes. So the question essentially, if I'm, if I'm interpreting this correctly, is if you're per the kind of person, if you're positioned as default in society, as your normal or as mainstream as it comes, and you're trying to understand what it's like for other people who have taboos enforced on them, you know, what's the best way to go about it? You know, it's gonna sound really overly simplistic, but I'll tell you why I'm just gonna say this. Half the time it's just listening. It's as simple as not trying to impose your own experience on it, it's, or rationalizing it, or justifying, or trying to figure it out. It's just taking people at their word. And it, that becomes a problem sometimes because, you know, I'll say, oh, I got street harassed, and immediately the answer is, well, what were you wearing? Frumpy jeans and a sweatshirt. What do you think I was wearing? That, you know, it, I get the most street harassment when I'm dressed completely slobbily. And it's because I seem more approachable, I think. Whereas if I'm wearing something fancy and nice and I'm walking around in a pair of heels and I look like I'm not taking anyone's crap, I get less street harassment, even though there's way more skin on display. So actually taking people's experiences seriously and not... And, and sometimes the impulse to, to try to rationalize or justify isn't coming from a bad place. You're just trying to understand. You're trying, so some of the people who've asked me, you know, what were you wearing? And I've asked them why they asked me that. They said, oh, well, I just wanted to see that, you know, I assumed that it would be better for you, there would be less street harassment if you dressed more conservatively. And so it's based on this assumption that's, that comes from a lack of understanding. But it gets in the way of understanding because when someone asked me, well, what were you wearing when that happened? I shut down. I immediately go, oh, you're just trying to apologize for those people's behavior and you don't actually care about me. So yeah, a lot of it is just listening, asking questions as carefully and as neutrally as possible, and learning as many experiences across a wide spectrum of society before starting to, to add your own two cents into it. So yeah, it's as simple as listening sometimes. And uh, I think there's a taboo against running over time, so. I'm going to say good day.